Hello and welcome to the BigML tutorial series. In this video, we will be discussing clusters. We will begin with an introduction in which we will see how to create a cluster in the typical BigML workflow using a one-click action. This demonstration will reveal the primary purpose of clusters, which is to find groups of self-similar instances in your data in an unsupervised way. And then we will explore the visualizations available to help understand the cluster results, including the definition of a centroid, the ability to export a cluster group as a separate data set, and the cluster summary report. In the basic features, we will explore the configuration options for creating a cluster, including choosing between the two clustering algorithms, k-means and g-means, and how they differ, the problem with missing numeric values in your data and how to fix it, and the model clusters feature, which creates decision trees that help understand the rules that define membership in each of the cluster groups. In the advanced section, we will discuss the configuration options for scaling numeric values, as well as weights and summary fields. And then we will introduce centroid and batch centroids, which are analogous to predictions and batch predictions for models. So what is clustering? Clustering is an unsupervised learning technique, which means that no labels are required in your data. This is useful because often data is not labeled, or labels are expensive. For example, imagine a data set containing the diagnostic measurements of thousands of patients that you would like to label true or false for a specific disease, say cancer or diabetes. It may be very costly to generate this label as you would need to hire a doctor to evaluate each patient, or perhaps several doctors to render a majority opinion. In these situations, clustering can help you understand your data. In fact, in some cases, clustering can even be used to reduce the cost of labeling a data set by sampling from the cluster groups that are found and then applying the label to the entire group. It does this by finding the self-similar groups of instances or rows in your data. For example, if you are analyzing the data from an e-commerce site, you could find groups of customers with similar behavior or preferences. Or in a medical context, clustering could find groups of patients with similar diagnostic measurements. Once completed, the output of clustering is a set of points called centroids. The centroid is the geometric center of the group of instances in that feature space. As such, it represents the average member of the group. And finally, the number of centroids that define the cluster, which is referred to as the k-value, can either be specified by you or determined by the clustering process. For example, if you are working with customer data and you know that you want to segment your customers into three groups, you would specify k equals 3. However, if you have no idea how many groups to use, you can ask the clustering algorithm to determine the best k for your specific data set. To make this more concrete, let's consider a sample of credit card transaction data. If we cluster this data, we will discover groups of transactions that are self-similar. For example, we might discover that these three rows, now highlighted in blue, are similar to one another. In fact, for all three rows, the authorization type was PIN, and the amount was close to $100. Of course, notice that the rows are only similar. They are not identical. In fact, the date, customer, account, purchase class, and zip codes are all different. And of course, we may find other groups of rows that are similar to one another. The magic of clustering is that it finds the best groups. In this example, if those three rows were in fact a cluster group that was found, then the centroid, or center of this group, would be defined as the point with the date equal to Wednesday, as this is the majority class. That is, of the three rows, two are marked as Wednesday. And the centroid would take the majority class for the remaining categorical values, customer, account, class, and zip code as well. And finally, the amount, which is numeric, at the centroid, would have a value of 104, which is the average of the three values 135, 94, and 83. Let's see a quick example of using clustering with the diabetes dataset and explore the patient groups that are found. From the dataset view, we can issue a one-click cluster. Note that in this example, the diabetes dataset does in fact have a label, that is, the diabetes true-false feature. 
but we can still run clustering and look for similar patients. Notice also that for a one-click cluster, we are not specifying the number of groups defined, and instead the algorithm will attempt to determine the best number for the k-value. The default cluster visualization shows each cluster group as a circle. In this case, the clustering process has found seven groups, and so there are seven circles displayed. The size of each circle is proportional to the number of instances in that group. So the largest here, cluster 5, has 193 instances, while the smallest, cluster 6, only has 36. The cluster in the center of the visualization, shown with a dark black outline, is set by simply clicking on it. The remaining clusters are then pushed away from the selected cluster in a mount that is proportional to the distance between the centroids of those clusters. The distances displayed on the screen are not absolute. That is to say that if we select cluster 2, we can see that clusters 5, 1, and 3 are closer to cluster 2 than 4, 0, and 6. But these distances being shown are not exact. They are only relative. When hovering the mouse over any of the cluster groups, the information about the centroid of that group shows up on the right-hand side of the screen. As you mouse off of the cluster group, the information panel disappears. If you would like to freeze this information, you can press the Shift key. And now the mouse can leave the selected cluster group without the information window closing. In the information panel, we can see the information about the centroid for this cluster. So members in this cluster all have a number of pregnancies that is near 6.24, and a plasma glucose of near 129.76, and a BMI of near 31.32, and so on. At the top of the panel, we can also see a distance histogram, which gives an idea of how compact this cluster is. That is, are most of the points near the centroid, or are they far away? There are also statistics available for this distance information as well. One thing to note is that although the clustering process is finding these groups of similar instances, it is not able to summarize them in a meaningful way, as it does not have any understanding of what these features mean. So for example, while an analyst might look at this group and decide to call it healthy with large family, the algorithm just called it cluster 2. However, because these human interpretable names are sometimes useful in further analyses, you can change the cluster name using the pencil icon here. When you are done examining the cluster group information, you can unfreeze the display by pressing the Escape key. The clustering algorithm also outputs a summary of the centroids, which can be accessed using the cluster summary report here. This report contains a summary of the algorithm used and the number of centroids found, the number of instances in each cluster group, the global cluster metrics, including the total sum of squares, etc. A list of all the centroids found and their associated coordinates. And statistics for the centroid and intercentroid distances. This report can also be downloaded in a CSV format. Sometimes it is convenient to be able to split a cluster group from the original dataset for further analysis. To do this, Select the cluster you would like to create a dataset from. Press the Shift key to freeze the information screen, and then press the Create Dataset button found here. This will create a new dataset that contains only the members of the selected cluster group. As you can see, this dataset, which represents the members of the Healthy with Large Family group, has 138 instances in it. Now let's review the basic configuration options for clusters. The first is the clustering algorithm to use. The choices are k-means and g-means. The difference is that k-means allows you to specify the number of cluster groups that you want to find, while g-means uses a special Gaussian test to iteratively find the best number of cluster groups.
If you don't know the number of cluster groups that you want, or do not have a reason to specify it, then gmeans, which is also the one-click default, is the right option. The second is the cluster parameter. For k-means, this is the number of cluster groups that you want the algorithm to find, also referred to as the k-value. Now, even though gmeans will determine the best k, there is still a cluster parameter called the critical value. This parameter controls how picky gmeans is about the clusters that it generates. A lower value makes gmeans more picky and will tend to result in a higher number of clusters being detected, whereas a larger critical value will tend to yield a smaller number of clusters. The default for the critical value is 5. The next setting is how the clustering algorithm should handle missing numeric values. This is a very important configuration option if you have missing values in your data. The problem is that the clustering algorithm internally is computing distances between the instances to decide how to cluster them, and the distance to a missing number is not well defined. This means that if a row of data has just one missing numeric value, the clustering algorithm by default will drop that row from the analysis. If every row in your data set has a missing numeric value, then the clustering process will actually fail. Note that this is only a problem for numeric values since the clustering process transforms categorical and text fields in a way similar to the one-hot encoding for logistic regression. And one of the encoded states is that the value can be missing. This means that the distance to a missing numeric or text field is well-defined and does not present a problem. So this configuration option applies only to missing numerics. The final basic configuration option is the model clusters. Enabling this option creates a decision tree model which predicts cluster membership for each of the groups. This can help you to understand the characteristics of each group that is discovered. This is disabled by default because it requires more computation to generate the model for each cluster group and therefore takes longer. Let's take a look at these basic configuration options using the diabetes data set again. Instead of using the one-click option, we will use the configure cluster option under the gears icon. Here we can see the selector that allows us to choose which clustering algorithm we would like to use, k-means or g-means, along with the associated cluster parameter for that algorithm. The default when configuring a cluster is to use k-means with the number of cluster groups set to eight. If we were to change this to seven, we will get the same cluster groups that gmeans found when using the one-click option in the last demo. This is because gmeans settled on k equals seven. For this demonstration, let's change the algorithm back to gmeans. Now we can see that the cluster parameter has changed from the number of clusters to the critical value, with the default being five. A large value will tend to result in fewer cluster groups while a smaller value will tend to result in more cluster groups. Let's reduce this to two and see what the impact is. We can also see the option for how to handle missing numeric values here. The default is to just ignore rows that have missing numeric values, which is fine for our current dataset since it does not appear to have any missing values as we can see from the dataset summary below. In actuality, this dataset does have missing data, but the missing values have all been replaced with zeros. For example, the insulin measurement has 121 zero values. Because these missing values have been handled with feature engineering, we don't need to use the default missing numeric selector above. If instead the insulin value had nulls instead of zeros for these 121 missing values, we could get the same clustering result by setting the default missing numerics to zero. But again, we don't need to do that in this situation. And finally, for this run, let's enable the model clusters as well. Now that the clusters have been computed, you can see immediately that reducing the critical value to 2 
has resulted in quite a few more cluster groups. How many? We can find out in the cluster summary. So 20 cluster groups. You can also find this information in the detail panel here. Let's take a closer look at one of these clusters. If we select, for example, cluster 1, then when we freeze the display, we will see that there are now two icons at the bottom of the centroid information panel. The first is the same button we had before that will create a data set from the instances in this cluster group. The other button will create the model that predicts membership in this cluster. If we click it, we will be taken to a tree model visualization. If we select this branch of the tree on the right, then in the information panel, we can see a rule that if the diabetes pedigree is less than 1.12, then the prediction of membership in cluster 1 is false. That is, the vast majority of cluster 1 patients all have a diabetes pedigree of greater than 1.12. From this branch on the left-hand side of the tree, we can see that even for those patients that do not match the first rule, we have a second rule which says that if the triceps skin thickness is less than or equal to 31, then membership in cluster 1 is false with a confidence of 87%. This tells us that the members of cluster 1 all have a high diabetes pedigree and a high triceps skin thickness. We can return to the cluster using the link here, and then rename this cluster using this new information. Note that it's also possible to use association discovery to better understand the cluster groups, which is demonstrated in the association discovery module. Now let's take a look at the advanced configuration features for clusters. The first is the option to configure specific scales for each feature. Because the clustering algorithm computes distances, the scale of each feature will impact the results. For example, imagine a data set of housing data with features like the number of bedrooms and the sale price. We might expect the range for the number of bedrooms to be from say 1 to 5, and the sale price may cover a range of numbers into the hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions. If we cluster these homes without scaling, the sale price will impact the distance calculation much more than the number of bedrooms because of this difference in scale. This means that the number of bedrooms will be effectively irrelevant compared to the sale price with respect to how the clusters are formed. To compensate for this, scaling can be applied. By default, all features are scaled so that their standard deviation is 1. If you have a specific requirement for scaling, it is possible to set scales per field in the advanced configuration. The next option is weighting. This is similar to model weights in that it adjusts the impact of individual instances in the clustering computation. Unlike model weights, the only weighting option is to specify a weight per instance as a feature in the data set. For clarity, scaling changes the impact of features, while weighting changes the impact of instances. The next option is summary fields. Marking a field as a summary field will exclude it from the clustering computation. Now, of course, this could also be done by deselecting the features when configuring the cluster. But the difference with summary fields is that although they will not impact the cluster computations, they will still be included in the clustering output. This is especially useful for instance labels. Finally, we have the resource type called centroids. Once a clustering has been computed, a new instance can be scored to see which cluster group, that is, which centroid, it belongs to. This is analogous to making predictions for a new instance with a model. And similar to predictions, it can also be done in batch. This allows the cluster assignment to be computed for an entire data set of instances and can output the results either in a new data set or a CSV available for downloading.
For this demo, we will switch to the Whiskies dataset. This dataset contains the flavor profiles as described by 12 characteristics for 86 different whiskies. The goal here is to cluster them into groups that have similar flavor profiles, perhaps so we can recommend whiskies that someone might like or dislike. First, let's just try a one-click cluster. In this case, we only get two groups, and this is partly because this dataset is very small, and there are simply not enough instances to generate more groups. At the extreme, a one-click cluster can sometimes return just a single group. Because we would prefer to have a larger number of cluster groups to play with, we will instead run k-means and choose a higher k-value. Let's return to the dataset. We'll switch the clustering algorithm to k-means and adjust the number of clusters to 10. Let's enable model clusters as well. In the advanced configuration panel, we can see the settings for scaling. Here's the button to toggle auto scaling on and off. And here's the selector we can use to choose a custom scaling for each feature. For example, we could decide to scale the smoke equality by a factor of 10, which would give that feature much more impact in selecting the clusters. We won't do that in this case, however, so let's remove this scale. Here we can also see the configuration for weights. If one of the features in this dataset contained the weights we wanted to use for each instance, we could specify it here. Again, we don't need weights for this dataset, so we'll just leave this unselected. Before we set the summary fields, let's scroll down and take another look at the features in this dataset. Notice that we have a feature called Distillery, which tells us the brand name of each of the whiskeys. And also notice that the dataset heuristics have marked this feature as non-preferred because the value is different for every instance and is therefore unlikely to be useful for clustering. However, we would like to include this distillery feature so that when we create the clusters, we know the name of each whiskey that is in the groups. We can override the non-preferred status by selecting this feature. but we don't want this feature to be included in the clustering process. To do this, we can list the distillery feature as a summary feature. Now the distillery feature will be carried along in the clustering output, but will not change how the clusters are assigned. Let's run this cluster and look at the results. Since we set k equals 10, we end up with exactly 10 clusters. We can explore them before using the centroid information, or since we enabled model clusters, we can use that as well. Let's take a closer look at this cluster, which seems to be off by itself here, which is cluster four. If we look at the model for this cluster, we can see two very strong rules. In particular, if the medicinal quality is greater than two, or if the smoky quality is greater than three, then the whiskey is likely a member of cluster four. Returning to the cluster view, we can add this insight to the cluster name. We could continue to analyze the remaining cluster groups in this fashion, giving user-friendly names to each one. Now let's create a centroid. Much like predictions, we have a form where we can input the value for a new instance and see which cluster it would be a member of. For example, this default input is a member of cluster 6. We can also experiment with other inputs to see which clusters these flavor profiles would be in. For example, adjusting the sweetness level seems to put us into cluster seven, whereas if we adjust the medicinal quality and the smoky quality, 
we will end up in cluster 4, which we have named appropriately. If we would like to output a new dataset with all of the cluster assignments, we can do so using a batch centroid. Returning to the cluster view, we can choose the batch centroid option from the cloud action icon. Now we can specify the name of the dataset that we want to assign cluster labels to. In this case, we will use the original Whiskey dataset. You can see in the example output that we will have all of the features from the original dataset plus the cluster assignment. Once we create the batch centroid, we can choose to output this as a new dataset or download this information in a CSV format. And now we can easily see all of the whiskeys and the cluster groups that they have been assigned to by similarity. In this tutorial, we have seen that clustering is an unsupervised learning technique for finding groups of self-similar instances in your data. And also that the number of groups can either be specified as part of the analysis or can be left to the platform to discover. In either case, the cluster groups discovered are represented by a list of centroids, which define the center of each group. As for configuration options, we learned about the two available algorithms, k-means and g-means, and their related cluster parameters, the k-value and the critical value. We also discussed the options for dealing with missing numeric values, adding summary fields, and the impacts of scales and weights. And we saw that the cluster model option can be enabled to help understand the characteristics that define each cluster group. And finally, we explored how a cluster can be used to assign the centroid label to new data using either a single centroid calculation or a batch centroid to label an entire data set.